Greetings, citizens, and welcome to another Real Comic Heroes podcast. I'm Travis. And I'm Patrick, coming from my bedroom, laying here on my sick bed. <laughs> but I'm here for you people. Yeah, you see what see what he's sacrificing for you? That's right. So you better comment and not call me a sissy whiny bitch. <laughs> All right, I'll probably comment that myself. Like, stop being a pansy. Right. I got the sniffles. <laughs> Okay, so, we're going to watch another... Oh, wait, we're not watching another 8 movie. Oh man. Ha. In fact, this is like the least ape-like Bond I've seen. Yeah, yeah. It's like hairless Bond. It's like they, they had to shave him down first. It's so weird. Like, right off the bat, I was used to seeing, you know, copious amounts of body hair. He is kind of rather smooth, isn't he? <laughs> I mean, a couple times that, that we see him without a shirt on, he is he is rather oh yeah, I mean rather bare chested. I don't know if that says more about us that we notice that, but well yeah. <laughs> I mean. So uh, yeah, we should probably tell him what we're talking about. Oh okay. <laughs> <laughs> yep, gay porn. Yeah, well yeah. 1973's Live and Let Die. Is that a Bond movie? Well, it's not an eight movie, so it must be a Bond movie. <laughs> yeah, and we actually got a song that I've like it's been heard of before. Yeah, it's a good song too. Yeah, it it, it kind of fit in with the beginning of this movie. Yeah, kind of jumps around. Oh yeah, the the tempo change yeah. and yeah, it all goes a couple different places. Yeah, because oh, yeah. we open up. I mean. It's a weird opening, yeah. for sure. I mean, right off the bat, it's like UN, and then like some weird dude sneaks in and does some weird sonic screwdriver death thing to the guy listening in. Yeah, it's like, does he kill him with... It's like he's pl- he presses down like a plunger like you would dynamite. <laughs> I know. So it must be like, I don't know why that you know is required, why not just push a button, but... It, so does the guy die from like getting a sonic that's frequency a, in his head? Yeah, that's what I thought. Like it uh, blew a hole in his through his ears and like, yeah, rattled his brains or something. Well, and the weird part for me was so we go from that guy. At, well, there's oh, three yeah. people we see. I thought the guy from the UN was the same guy that got killed by the snake in the third scene that we see. Yeah, because they look. They look the same. They look like the same guy. Well, I got confused because, like, okay, first is Sonic brain scrambling in New York. Yeah. yeah. Then it goes to New Orleans with a death parade. And right. He gets shivved, and then they do a weird drop the coffin. Because everybody up. in New Orleans is in on it. Yeah. <laughs> and then it goes to, like, a voodoo ritual. So I thought we were still in New Orleans. Right. I didn't realize it was a, a separate island. Yeah, San San Monique. It's like a fake place that we... In the UN, you see a guy, you know, sitting at the table for San Monique. Oh. Yeah, I didn't even notice. Okay. <laughs> so that's that's kind of how they're connected, you know. Yeah, I knew they were connected, but, like, at first I didn't yeah. make the connection. Sure, yeah. Because... I mean, basically, this movie is all about retracing steps, it seems like. Yeah. And, uh, so, yeah, it goes into, uh, after the snake voodoo area, and it, like, nips him, and he dies instantly. <laughs> uh, the New Orleans guy gets shivved and tossed in a box. Yeah. And the parade gets jumping. And then, like, yeah. as soon as, like, the voodoo thing's done, it goes right into, uh, Live and Let the Die. Song. McCartney. Yeah. Shows up, and I'm yeah. freaked out by the imagery. Oh, okay, like, the flaming skull, wide open and... eyes, and skull, and then oh yeah, the uh... like it was freaking me out. Yeah, it was. It's a creepy opening. I was just like, holy hell, where are we going with this? Yeah, like I wasn't ready to jump across like all these locations and all these deaths. Yeah, it's kind of jarring, and I guess it's just 
you know, I, I don't know if it's meant to be to throw us off and, you know, kind of just dump you right into it and you're not sure, you know, why all these deaths are connected. It's kind of like the uh, opening of Dr. No when you see the uh, the secretary gets killed and then the the Strangways gets killed. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. You know, it's kind of like that. Like that. Dr. No, I noticed in this one. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if that was on purpose or not, but... I don't know. Seeing it's the new Bond and all. Right. But right off the bat, I was like, kind of wondering what this movie was going to be like. And man. Sure. Things did not go as I thought they would. Right. <laughs> well, I guess the the book apparently touches on, you know, Mr. Big is the villain. There's no Kananga and there's no, like, New Orleans. There's no, I don't think there's even any voodoo element in it. Maybe Maybe that's part of it, but it's apparently a completely different plot, you know, so... Yeah, the other thing is I didn't feel like uh, those guys that got killed were fellow agents. Yeah, they didn't seem like agents, and that's one of the kind of a weird thing about the Bond universe is that no one else apparently ever seems as fit or charming or good-looking as James Bond. The rest of the agents are always just, you know, average-looking white guys. Yeah. Yeah. They get all weird, like, oh, man, this movie, I'll, I'll get to it when we are at that point. Okay. It's kind of weird with me. Yeah. But it, after the weird voodoo sequence and song, it basically goes to, you know, your stereotypical Bond in bed. And, yeah, uh, which kind of... the lack of body hair. <laughs> right, yeah. Um, it really kind of bugs me that we've got a brand new James Bond, but there's absolutely no, you know... Big spectacle, big entrance, big introduction to Bond. It's just you know middle of the night, or it's or it's I guess early early morning, and we just you know open on some some lady in in Bond's bed, and then he's woken up by M, who comes to his house. So it's just a strange way to to meet the new Bond. Yeah, it's sort of. I don't know if that's sort of going to lay the ground for that he's the uh, sort of swinging Bond and not really the serious out for vengeance Bond. Right. Like, uh, it seems like Bond was getting darker and darker and then and right. now they're starting over again. Yeah, so, they're going for um, the more lighthearted. Um, <laughs> and I I like the scene between M and Bond in in Bond's apartment or townhouse or wherever he lives. Um it's a nice little exchange between the two of them, but again, it's a weird like, why not have this scene or have their you know back and forth? Why not have that at MI6? You know? Yeah, I mean, sort of laid the time like uh, the girl was running around like it was some kind of Benny Hill skit, and right. it was kind of weird. And then uh, what's her face, uh, Money Penny shows up. And, yeah, Money Penny. Yeah, and that was her only real scene in the movie. Yeah, it's the only time we see M or Money Penny, yeah. and there's no Q. Like he's he's not there. <laughs> or, she... Like sort of mentioned, but he's not in it. <laughs> right. Yeah. Because they go over That's... the gadgets and the watch is cool, that... but <laughs> the watch is cool, but they use the shit out of it. Like that's <laughs> the one gadget, unless you count the espresso machine that M yeah. is fascinated by. Yeah. You know. Yeah, um, anything else he uses, really? I mean. I... No, he uses the watch as the magnet and the little buzz saw, and I think that's a, I think that's all it does. But he uses it a couple times. Um, <laughs> yeah, I like that it always doesn't work out though. At least, right? We'll get to that part later, but it, it's not okay. like a, a foolproof. Uh, gadget. Oh yeah, yeah, right. So, um, let's see. I like the nineteen uh, seventies kitchen on head. It was very hip. Yeah, it's it was really interesting. Like he had all these copper pots everywhere. Is this the first time we've seen Bond's uh, house? I feel like we saw his place. I want to say as early as um, Doctor No or really? Goldfinger. Because doesn't he come home and someone is. In dressed in one of his shirts, uh, putting a golf ball 
Oh uh, yeah, maybe. I think I think that happens in one of the. Yeah, that does happen. I just maybe forgot yeah. it was his house. I think Although, it's his house that 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 happens in. He's probably got a few places. I'm guessing. Could be. Yeah. <laughs> I uh, just felt weird. Be like it felt like a sitcom when we were in his like his house. Yeah, like and I was watching Three's Company or something. Yeah, well, and the woman who's sneaking around is, you know, we learned from M is the Italian an Italian agent because you know M is praising him for the Rome affair, like some some kind of mission that he just got off of in Rome. You know, went really well, but they're having trouble locating their Italian agent, and that's when Bond is like seeing her kind of sneaking around, and she she hides in a closet, and Money Penny spots her. So it is kind of a, you know, it's a funny little scene of, you know, but I kind of don't understand why it's a big deal yeah. that Bond get caught, you know, in his home, but it, maybe it's just a interagency, you know. No, no, that your agents don't fraternize, maybe. But Money Penny knows and doesn't say anything. I don't know. It was a weird yeah. opening. Yeah, but I, I do like it. The uh, you know once once M leaves and Bond just tells her you know thank you, like it's a instead of the the usual flirting between the two of them, it's just a nice little moment of like hey thanks for covering my covering my ass. Yeah, I feel like uh, their uh, moment has gone. Money yeah. Penny and Bond. <laughs> yeah, and I'm glad because I was kind of feeling bad for Money Penny. She's sort of right, like, uh, sort of like a sad puppy dog for a while. Yeah, for a while it just felt like he was stringing her along way too much. But um, I did enjoy the first use of the gadget, where he oh yeah down her zipper. Oh, that's that was nice. <laughs> yeah. So this, this and of course, and this is where Bond was going to be kind of. Uh, goofy, right, and uh, a little more nonchalant with things. Yeah, and just his line about that you know Henry would do. Yeah, and Roger Moore has a way of de- delivering the the one liners. You know the something about being magnetizing. You know when he's taking down her zipper, and yeah. there's plenty of other little little one liners that that are more more present in Roger Moore's Bond than. Than before. And then I uh, wrote down that old uh, Felix Leiter's back. Oh yeah, yeah, we got Felix again, but he's big um, in this one. What's that? He's big in this movie. Like, what do you mean? All his... over this movie. Yeah, yeah. Like before, he... I always thought of him as like a side character that jumped right. in once in a while, but this time, I felt like he was more like M than M was. Kind of like he's constantly there. Cleaning up Bond's messes wherever he goes. Yeah, but I always thought of him like that anyway. Yeah, but it is weird that we see him more that more in this one. Um, it's a, it's a strange movie. Like we don't get we don't check in with M later in the movie. We don't see Money Penny again. You know, you never see Q. Um, so there's just some it, there's some some points in the middle of the movie where you kind of. If you zone out, you could forget really quickly that you're even watching a Bond movie. Oh, yeah. Because, you know, it's not the same actor. It's uh, the tone of the movie's a little different. The subject matter is different than anything we've seen. So, yeah. I mean, it's kind of all over the place. I was kind of hoping early on that I was, it was going to be good because I liked the uh, first sort of action sequence with the passed out taxi driver. Um,. Oh yeah, yeah. Where he that was a good. Dart from the side mirror of the pit mobile. <laughs> yeah, I like the. Uh, that's a pretty cool little assassin, you know, weapon. Yeah, I, I just thought the, the car. sequence was shot really good with the uh, cars bumping into each other and. Yeah, I know, it looked very good, and I was looking forward to more uh, action sequences after that. And it feels like there were a a lot of little action beats kind of sprinkled throughout the whole movie. Um Man, I did not get that same feeling. Okay. And, it, I mean, it, it sort of jumps us to the towards the end, but holy hell, man, I could not handle that boat chase. Yeah, no, the boat chase goes on far too long. Well, that, and it, like, jumped into, like, another movie. I thought I was watching, like, freaking Smokey and the Bandit all of a sudden. That's, oh, I'm, I'm glad you said that. Because that made, when I was watching all of that, I had to look up when Smokey and the Bandit 
came out because I thought like you know I assumed that Smokey and the Bandit came out like the year or two before this one, and that the producers were like, oh, you know, the audiences love that kind of you know car chase or you know whatever. So I thought that that was maybe an influence, but Smokey and the Bandit and a bunch of those other like Convoy and Cannonball Run and like all those movies didn't come out for a couple more years. So I assumed that this was kind of a producers thinking that this is what audiences would really want. So maybe, but it's interesting that you said yeah. Smokey and the Bandit because I got that same exact thought. It was either that or um, uh, what the hell is it called? The one with the General Lee, Dukes of Hazard. Oh yeah, because it was yeah, same, it very much had that feel. Bumbling sheriff hillbilly thing. Oh, yeah, but uh, that's towards the end of the movie, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but yeah, it was this whole movie. I should have known from the beginning that we were going to jump around and it was going to be jarring. Yeah, because man, we changed locations a lot. Yeah, and uh, I guess, I guess the whole uh, New Orleans thing was one of the producers really liked jazz music. And so he wanted to incorporate jazz into the movie somehow. So that someone, you know, they they brought up the idea of using New Orleans as a location, and they were like, "Well, we can only we we can't afford to send the entire, you know, all the actors down there, which is why we don't see anyone, you know, we never see Bond in New Orleans. Yeah. You know, he might be, it might be set in Louisiana, but no, you know, the only people we actually see in New or- New Orleans." are one of the guys that get get killed in the very beginning, and I think it was... Oh, and then the second death that happens. Yeah, I mean, it's basically the same scene with the same... Yeah. Death parade. Same setup, yeah. (laughs) So that's the only time that they shot there, but... um, Yeah, it was just... I don't know. Um, Yeah, I don't want to get on that boat sequence, because I think that pretty much ruined the movie for me. Okay. Yeah, I, I felt the same... Uh, same way, pretty much. Well, it really. I wish I timed it. I felt like it lasted a half hour. I thought about that too. I thought it was easily probably twenty minutes oh. of just and boat chases from start to so finish. With probably boring. what's that? Boat chases are so freaking boring. Yeah, like, how it, many it seems... things can you jump? <laughs> yeah, and I don't know if you've ever seen the Police Academy movie, but they do it way better. <laughs> I probably watched them as a kid, but I I couldn't remember which ones I've seen. I don't even. It might have been two or three or something. Yeah. But they have like jet skis and boats and stuff, and it's essentially very similar. Right. Stunts, you know, it's like jumping boats and stuff. Right. But it didn't last like a whole freaking half hour. Yeah. Oh. Um. Anyway. So what what did you think about Roger Moore as our new Bond? Eh, I don't know, man. I, he didn't. He had like the smoothness. Yeah. He had that down, but I didn't feel like he was as much of a badass as Connery. Right. Like he just didn't seem like he could whoop anybody. Yeah. Even though he was, I mean, he was a decent sized dude, so. Sure. I mean, physically he he's there, but he didn't come off as being particularly uh, good in a fight or tough. Right. Uh, he was more talk. It felt like. I thought so too. I thought I, I, I wrote down that he felt like a he felt more like a proper English gentleman. Yeah. With a lot of uh, sophistication, you know that that Connery didn't have. Like, as I like to say, he didn't have that uh, archer to him. <laughs> yeah. Where he, he could go crazy and uh, destroy everything in sight. Yeah. Um, it's funny because. I listened to James Bonding. It's uh, oh, one of the nerd podcast about James Bond. What's that? Is it a bondage podcast? Oh yeah. Okay. <laughs> it's uh, Matt Myra from the Nerdist and uh, Matt Gorley from he's from like Super Ego podcast. Yeah, okay. Or uh, what's that other one with Paul F. Tompkins? Thrilling Adventure Hour. Oh okay yeah yeah. He's one of the guys from from that. But they together they do a James Bond podcast, and they kind of sum up. The, the differences in Sean Connery and Roger Moore as as thus like Connery always kind of got into got into some heat about maybe he would slap around a woman if he felt you know the situation called for it whereas Roger Moore had to uh, press charges against his wife for her beating up on him 
<laughs> so it kind of, you know, nice. kind of gives you an idea of the, the two completely different guys playing two completely different Bonds. Yeah, I mean, I, so I, I can see that, but, I mean, I think it's also extra weird because, I mean, he looks absolutely nothing like either Connery or that other dude that was in there for one episode. Oh, Lazenby? Yeah. Yeah. Like, I felt like Connery and that guy seemed more similar than more. Yeah, they both had that rugged quality. Yeah. I don't know. It, yeah, it was, uh, like like you said, it, it was, con- I wasn't entirely sure I was watching a Bond movie. Yeah. And I like Roger Moore's performance. You know, he's, he's very natural, he's very uh, smooth and charming as hell. So what you're complaining is that he doesn't beat enough women in this. Yeah, exactly. Okay. <laughs> just, just making sure I understood you correctly. <laughs> did I did I say that? <laughs> well, it's uh, it's just uh, I think the I think I need like another shot of Roger Moore. I need to see how he handles the next one. Okay. Before I can really. Yeah, uh, yeah. Drop an opinion on him. Well, and another thing about this Bond is this Bond takes a bath, which... <laughs> oh, yeah, that was weird. I mean, you know... Bath time Bond. Some people are into baths, and I guess that's okay, but <laughs> it, for me it just felt very different. And, like, at one point, right after the bath, he's looking for his gun, and it's just gone. He can't find his gun, and it's like, you know, that, that's not Bond. Yeah, he didn't, like, set up any kind of booby traps, like... Right. He was poking the, the, around, like, looking for bugs or something. Yeah, he found all the, the bugs, the listening devices, but didn't set any other traps or anything. But he did but, keep the tradition of booking his room under his name. Yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> and we also meet the worst agent in history. Oh, Rosie Carver. Oh, I know she was trying to play... A bumbling, like, agent. But even when she wasn't, she was still horrible. See, I don't think she was trying to play bumbling. I think she's a double agent, which we eventually yeah. find out. But I think she's bumbling no matter which side she's working for. That's what it seemed like. I was like... Yeah, I, I don't think she was acting, you know. Cause so. it, it was just like, I wrote down, essentially, as soon as we met her, worst agent ever. And they even allude yeah. to that in the movie. Yeah. Well, and I like her line about it's her second mission, you know, and he asks her what her first mission was, and she's like, oh, I was working with, uh, I think it's Baines, the guy that got killed in uh, New Orleans. Uh, yeah, and he's like, oh, that's Or it might have been, uh, yeah, it might have been Baines that she was working for in San Monique. So, kind of tells you what, uh, you know, and this is before, you know, she's a double agent, but it's like, had you been a competent agent, would he have still been alive, you know? Well, we uh, jumped uh, the whole uh, Harlem section. Yeah, you want to talk about that? Oh, man. Uh, How much, like, lingo can you throw at a white dude? Oh, man. They're like, you got a honky on your tail. Yeah. Oh, what's the one I wrote down? It's like following well, you got a cue ca- ball? Yeah, yeah, it's like following a cue ball. Um, <laughs> I like the the cabbie. Oh, Who yeah. tells him, for, for 20 bucks, he'll take you to the Ku Klux Klan cookout. I know. I wrote down, man, 20 bucks bought a lot in the 70s. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, I don't know. I kind of like the idea of Bond in in New York, for one. Yeah, no, but, I dug it. You know, it was just a little... In Harlem is... And apparently, the uh, production had to pay, you know, pay extra money for uh, security and protection while they were in Harlem. <laughs> and their uh, their welcome kind of ran out pretty quickly, and they were encouraged to leave after you know, kind of before their time was supposed to be up. So well, it was sort of that part of like the jarringness of this movie. I felt like we were watching a black exploitation film. Yes, because yes. people were just acting so weird, and like you had the one guy saying, "Put a, a P or a APB on a pit mobile or something." Oh, yeah. I was like a white pimp mobile. It's just weird. I know. I was like, don't you just need the make and model? You don't need to say pimp mobile. Right. 
but well, <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. But uh, it uh, did introduce uh, the tarot card reader. Uh, is her name Solitaire? Yeah, her name's Solitaire. That's so weak. Yeah. You went from uh, Pussy Galore to Solitaire. Yeah, they have kind of fallen off of the uh, the naming convention. Because even, like, Rosie Carver, that's not anything fun or exciting. Well, I'm just saying, like, you go from Pussy Galore to Solitaire, and Solitaire's, like, code for uh, lonely time. Yeah. So it's, <laughs> it's like, going from one parallel to the other. Yeah. Uh, I was just like, uh, I mean, that and she played with cards, so it's like yeah. not very creative. <laughs> but I kind of like the idea that she's she's a tarot reader or a fortune teller as long as she's still pure. Oh, yeah. The whole uh, um, uh, priestess virtue thing. Yeah. Yeah. So obviously we know what's going to happen to her later. Oh, right off the bat, he turns over the lover card. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Like, of course he did. Yeah. <laughs> and I like how he's just so nonchalant about being taken out back. Yeah, that's one thing I like about Roger Moore's Bond, is that he he never seems worried or, you know, he plays it well. And I think that's something that Connery also did well. So, you know, he, Roger Moore was able to adapt or pick up that that persona of Bond a little bit. Yeah, but I, I was worried because I saw Mr. Big and I knew it was a mask. Yeah. I was like, oh, God, don't be a white guy under there. Well, see, and I forgot that it was a mask. I forgot that it was, you know, essentially Kananga in disguise. Yeah. So at the start of it, I just thought, I, you know, I honestly just forgot about this, the twist at the end, or not even at the end, like in the middle. Um and that it was just some weird looking guy, you know. Yeah. I couldn't It looked weird and I was I knew something was up with it. Well, and apparently in the in the book cuz you know how Ian Fleming always writes that his villains have either a medical condition or some kind of oddity about them. Apparently Mr. Big has some sort of pulmonary disease and so his skin is very gray just cuz it doesn't get like the melatonin or whatever in the skin doesn't circulate like it should or doesn't, you know, it's not... His skin just has a gray quality to it, <laughs> which is why he looks that way. Ah. You know, and you have the fact that it's it's Yafet Kodo, who plays Kananga, is wearing, you know, a mask. So it's it's already kind of unsettling. <laughs> yeah. So. And then you had Mr. Claw. Yeah, uh, Teehee. <laughs> his name was Teehee. Yeah, Teehee. You have Teehee, and then you have Whisper. Uh, Whisper, who I I wrote down as not Ron Funches. <laughs> if you're f- familiar with uh, Ron Funches, the comedian, they just to me it looked like Ron Funches. <laughs> I didn't even think about that. <laughs> uh, so I like our I like the henchmen in this movie. Um, Teehee with that ridiculous claw. Oh yeah. Um, and I'm like, if, and it's not, if it took your whole arm, why not make it the same size as your other one? <laughs> not a foot longer. <laughs> yeah. I felt like it was like the same special effect used in Happy Gilmore. Yeah. Where he's holding on to a wooden hand. Oh, God, I forgot about that. <laughs> so it was that same thing. You know, you can tell that it's extended further than it should be. Yeah, yeah. Especially when there's like a shot of him from behind walking and one arm is, you know, normal length and then the... The arm on the opposite side of him is, you know, ten inches longer or whatever. I mean, is it that hard to bend your hand in? Right. And attach something to that? Yeah. It shouldn't be. But, eh, whatever. Yeah. And then uh, Bond uh, gets taken out back and gets saved by a random agent that was, you know, uh, tailing him. Yeah, one of the many, like, people all, all throughout Harlem that radios oh, yeah. you know, as he's going by and it's like is so we've already been shown that everyone in new orleans is you know in on it or you know in mr biggs or in kananga's pocket and now we're being shown that everyone in harlem is also a criminal yep. and don't forget the <laughs> island yeah except for the tourists right because it, it, it's basically trying to show you that anyone that is like 
at all not white is part of this conspiracy. Right. And that's that kind of bothers me. Um, it's I don't know how intentional that part of it is. Well, it sort of makes you think that way. It's like, okay, right. so, well, he's probably in on it, too. Or is it, like, Mr. Uh, Kananga has so much influence and everyone's just afraid of him, so everyone just goes along with, you know, with everything, or, you know, so it could be just, you know, behaving that way out of fear, but it seems like everyone is in Mr. Biggs or Mr. Uh, Kananga's pocket. Yeah, you know? I mean... It's pretty evident that he's got a lot of money, and we learn yeah. later why. Yeah. With the whole uh, poppy field scene. Right, right. Um, I will say this is the least uh, evil villain plot. Like, <laughs> Yeah, he's just a drug lord. It's very practical. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's not like any other villain so far that Bond has crossed. Right. I, I almost feel like it's too uh, sort of pedestrian for Bond. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I mean... And that goes back to the producers. They When, they, when the producers decided to take on this novel, you know, at this time, it was because, you know, they, they thought it would be daring to cover a, a story that was, you know, in the time of, like, Black Panther movements and other racial movements. They thought taking on a villain who was essentially just, you know just a drug lord in Harlem. You know, they thought that that would be a somehow more appropriate of a time to do this story. I mean, it's so, kind of nice to have some variety at least. In yeah, I don't have too much problem with the a smaller, you know, criminal element in this movie. It's not a world threat like we're kind of used yeah. to. And at least you got an agent that's, you know, uh, on the side of good. Yeah. It's not like anyone that's Black is automatically a bad guy. No, but we're when we meet. I think is his name Southers, the guy that saves Bond in the alley. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That's who I'm talking about. Yeah. No, it is nice, but even when we first meet him, we're not sure is he just going to kill Bond. Oh, yeah. You know, we don't know who he is, but you know, quickly they let on that he's CIA. Yeah. And then you have uh, Quarrel Jr. or whatever. Yeah, Quarrel Jr. <laughs> um. And I guess that's because uh, this was the follow-up book to uh, Casino Royale. Okay. So Quarrel would have been in this book, so they needed a Quarrel, you know, in the movie. So they just made it his son, who's almost the exact same age as Quarrel. <laughs> <laughs> you know, babies having babies. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I I did uh, I did like his entrance though. Quarrels, yeah. Just sleeping on the boat. <laughs> yeah. He's like, this fellow looks like he's ready to go. Yeah, he, he's eager for the work. <laughs> and I like that Rosie, you know, she thinks she's doing a good job and, you know, thinks she's, you know, discovered, you know, someone who's out, out to do no good or whatever, out to do them harm. So she's, you know, tries to be proactive in taking out Quarrel, but, you know, again, she's just wrong, but... Yeah, I mean... But she she meant well. Or, I like that she left the safety on and she's supposed to be an agent. Yeah, and apparently those revolvers don't have safeties. Oh, really? <laughs> apparently not, so that's either a goof or, you know, but yeah. Yeah, what was it? Uh, oh, God, I'm, I wrote down something and I'm trying to remember what it was. Okay. <laughs> Uh, oh, now I remember. Uh, Bond has a uh, penchant for cigars in this movie. Yeah, that was like a, a thing about Roger Moore is he didn't smoke, so he wouldn't do any smoking cigarettes anyways. Yeah, I was about to say, because I saw cigars a few times. Yeah, that's apparently that's his thing, is the cigars. Okay. and He was like paragliding um, with a cigar. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Just like, um, I want to say that Dalton is a, is a cigarette smoker, but then when you go back to later on, you go to Pierce Brosnan, I think he's a cigar guy, so... But then he also doesn't, uh, Roger Moore doesn't drink, you know, vodka martinis or anything like that in this one. He's drinking, I think, bourbon oh, okay. at the club. Yeah. So just some, some small little character differences. Yeah, it's like bourbon, no ice. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Which I like that once the uh, once they put Bond in the little turntable booth that uh, 
the waiter brings the drink over, takes his money, and then drinks the drink. <laughs> so, it's a nice little touch. Or uh, yeah, there was. So yeah, the movie kind of goes from Harlem to let's see where do they go? They go to Island. from Harlem to San Monique yeah. pretty quickly. Um, Bond finds out that Kananga has left New York, taken solitaire, and they're you know headed back to Kananga's island in San Monique. Yeah, and then uh, Coral shows them where it's at, and there's like yeah, that's right, and nobody goes up there but him. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, Bond is like paragliding into the place with his cigar. Yeah, it's kind of a an odd little scene of. It's not really an action scene, but it's I think it meant to be exciting. Um, there's one cool moment where Bond, you know, he is hang gliding in and kind of kicks the guy off the cliff. Yeah, um, that's kind of cool. But then he like does a weird wardrobe change. Yeah, I don't get the because uh, he's in like black fatigues and then he rips him off so that he's in a khaki pants and what is he, he flips the jacket inside out yeah. so it's like a sport sport jacket or something. That was it's, weird. Yeah. I was like, are they making a toy or something with, like, different outfits <laughs> quick, for Bond, and that's why it's... Right. <laughs> quick change Bond. Yeah. <laughs> I was just like, why is that there? Is it... Yeah. It made no sense to me. I'm like, if you're trying to infiltrate something, you shouldn't then change your clothes into something easily spotted. Right. But, I mean, I mean, he's already a cue ball, so... Yeah. He already sticks out pretty well. <laughs> oh, yeah, we sort of uh, missed the whole... Uh, I think we saw it before this. We saw the weird coconut figures. Oh, the scarecrows. Yeah, yeah. You, I mean, you knew right away those were no good. Oh yeah, like and Bond. You find ignores out them. <laughs> What's that? And Bond just ignores them. Yeah, to him they're they're a sign. They're meant to keep out tourists, but to him it means that he's headed in the right direction if he keeps seeing scarecrows. So well, I mean, it, I don't understand why he doesn't like dismantle them or something because it. Right. It's pretty evident that they could kill him at any point. Yeah. They've either they've either got cameras in them or they have poison darts or machine gun or you know, their guns, so but that's not Bond style. He'd rather, you know Yeah, and I mean they did try to early on when he was doing his uh Bond bath. Yeah. He's got snakes thrown in his room. Right. And it's gotta be the least suspenseful attempt on Bond's life I've ever seen on film. Yeah, it's not as good as the tarantula yeah. in uh, in Doctor No. Although it was cool it's... that he uh, used the flame aerosol can thing. <laughs> yeah, no, that was a cool cool method of of killing the snake. But like, I don't know, it wasn't like the tension wasn't there. Right, you you knew he was gonna. I mean, obviously we knew it wasn't gonna kill him, but yeah, um, yeah, like it didn't even have a chance. <laughs> right. But man, uh, but I, that's, I like that's having that's a hard we time meet. tracking where I am in this movie. Sure. Like, is Rosie already dead by the time he paraglides in? Um, because I know she's trying to take him to a specific location for them to jump him, and then she uh, Bond, right. uh, you know, said, you know, you said he was up the hill where he got killed. The paragliding must come. Okay, the paragliding comes later because okay. he, yeah. He and, and Rosie have already gone back to the island. She kind of reveals herself, or he catches on that she's a double agent. After they get busy. After they get busy on you know on the picnic blanket. <laughs> um, um, he threatens to kill her, so see, he's threatening women. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so then, yeah, she dies from one of the scarecrows. And then, yeah, later... That's where it gets fuzzy for me as well, of, of when does, at that point, when Rosie dies... It feels like he goes straight to the boat again and does the paragliding. Yeah, it must be. Okay, and then he shows and up then, in the headdress that the solitaire lady wears. Yeah, because once he's, once he's had a wardrobe change, that's when he me- meets up with solitaire. Yeah. And then, of course, he's already got, you know, he goes up there with... 50 sets of uh, lover tarot cards on him. I know. So that he I, I must... I guess that's you know, why he went to the tarot shop in the... Right, uh, in the hotel, yeah. yeah. So did he buy... Okay, so is there a deleted scene of Bond sitting in his hotel room opening up 50, 75 sets? <laughs> or did he go in there and somehow buy 
50 to 75 single lover cards. Because <laughs> I want to see that scene of him just in his hotel room, opening up pack after pack, and just digging through to find the lover card <laughs> to make his own stacked deck. Yeah, I'd like to see the clerk who, if he did buy 50 lover cards, hand him the 50 cards and be like, yeah, okay, buddy. <laughs> you have fun with that. Yeah. Yeah, that is, I didn't think about it that way, that he'd have to go through and pick out the lover cards. <laughs> but even that he, even that he, like, had the fore, forethought to, like, And there was a like, lot well, I'm of go, cards. What's that? It was a lot of cards. It was a lot of cards, but even the, the thinking that he knew he was going to run this scam on on Solitaire. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's just weird. And then he like yeah. keeps it on him. Right. Like, so in the hang glider, he has a pack of lover cards on him. I mean... <laughs> so just keep that in mind next time you watch this movie, that it's just it's just silly. But I like that, you know... It's it's so Bond to take this woman with a supernatural power. <laughs> oh, yeah. And then, you know, as soon as he has his way with her, that power's gone, you know. So she is, you know, she sacrifices this gift that she has just to kind of give him some information that he probably could have gotten some other way. Well, that, and he kind of lied to her. Well, Completely lied to her. Yeah, because he, like, fooled her into believing her own power. Yeah, yeah. Well, she's like, oh, I pulled the lover card. It must be destiny. And he, you know, he reveals the lover cards to us, the audience, in a manner which she could have also looked over and saw, you know. Well, he does straight up tell her, at least. Well, later, yeah, <laughs> that that he stacked the deck in his favor. So she's given up this this awesome power, and... It's weird because once once they've had sex, she's into it now. Like she's ready to go around too. Yeah. You know. Well, that's Bond. That's Bond. Yeah. But it gets weird. Like when they escape the island and end up uh, in uh, New Orleans again. Yeah. And they catch them. It's like she turns a one eighty again. Yeah. And I was th- like, cause so she was faking that. It was because really it looked weird. like she swung at him, right? Yeah. I thought so too. I that part completely confused me. It's like she just said, like she like automatically started joining these guys that were capturing him. Yeah, because it looked like she. Yeah, so Bond and and Solitaire show up to this. Well, they trying to think of how it plays out. They take a boat to the airport yep. in San Monique. They fly to New Orleans, and then they get in the taxi. that just happens to be the same taxi driver in New York, right, <laughs> Mister Big's t- cabbie is there. Like, you couldn't have seen those sideburns coming? <laughs> right. So they, that, the cabbie takes them kind of back to the airport, or back around the airport to Mr. Big's plane. Yep. And then, yeah, it's it's once they're confronted, it looks like she swings at him, and maybe that's her creating a diversion. I don't know. She seems like she's willing to go with those guys. Yeah. And then Bond just leaves her there. <laughs> yeah, he does. Right, because they they give they give chase all all throughout this little airport, oh, and they wreck so like bad. five or six five or six of the little planes. Yeah, I didn't like that scene at all. I didn't either. It was kind of a cool use of like taking these small small planes, like using them as a, a getaway vehicle, but it just goes on too long. There's the the weird lady taking uh, yeah. Flying lessons, you know. Uh, and the cars are, like, crashing for no reason. Yeah. Like, they're just out of control. <laughs> it's not like right. the plane's moving very fast. Yeah. Any one of those cars could have, like, rear, like rear-ended that plane. Yeah. Um, we did, uh, speaking of, like, chase scenes and stuff, The uh, when Bond is taking Solitaire from the island or from her mansion or house or whatever to the boat, they had that cool uh, d- double-decker bus chase. Oh, yeah. Like, that was really well done and pretty cool. Yeah. I mean, what was it? Uh, oh, yeah, it was the, uh, like, uh, island cops that were chasing after him. Yeah, because, again, all the cops and all the people on the island work for Mr. Big or Mr. Or Kananga. 
So even even the cops are corrupt on San Monique. Of course. You know. So yeah, all the cops are chasing Bond who's they've they've taken over this uh double decker bus and I, I like the chase scene. It's it's kinda cool. Yeah, it's not too bad. I mean, it's probably one of the better ones in the movie. Yeah. But then they pretty much immediately follow it up with the the airplane chase scene mm-hmm. a couple minutes later. Yeah, that sort of killed it for me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then how do we go from there from what's what's the next well, they catch what do we them and then they there? don't they take them back to the alligator farm? Oh, that's right. Yeah, they uh I'm trying to think how do they catch him? Yeah. I feel like they should have caught him after the airplane scene. Right. Cuz there were I don't remember how he got out of that airplane. No, 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 no. Um Bond Bond just escapes the airport. I don't remember how. <laughs> I don't but he does. <laughs> Because my notes say that Bond escapes airport and some for some reason leaves Solitaire there. And then Bond and Felix check out the Filet of Soul oh, Club that's right. yeah. in New Orleans where they're supposed to meet Southers. Yep. Um Southers gets killed the same way in the you know, New Orleans funeral style yeah. as the guy in the beginning of the movie. So He's obviously not going to show up. So Felix and Bond are in the club, the Filet of Soul, which is run by Kananga. And that's when we get Bond uh, that's right. getting lowered into the floor. I know. I like, does every it's, seat have a booby trap? Yeah, if it's not, if it's not uh, you know, if it's not... If it's that booth one rotated into the wall. wall. Like, yeah, which is kind of cool, but, <laughs> you know... And I like that Bond specifically, you know, points out like he'd rather have a table instead of a booth. Yeah. So. Although they were pretty quick at replacing the table and drinks. Yeah, that's what I like about it. I mean, and and none of the other club goers are surprised. Oh, you know, it doesn't. On it. Exactly, everyone is in on it. <laughs> uh. And it's just unfortunate. It's like we're being shown all throughout this movie, aside from Southers, who works for CIA. Every other black person in this movie, and aside from Quarrel, I was gonna say, <laughs> you know, everyone else is in on it, in on it, or in Kananga's pocket, or maybe they're afraid of Kananga. Yeah, it's just weird to see, you know, the entire community is in on it. So, I don't know. Maybe they're trying to make a, a statement or something. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, but I don't. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? I don't. <laughs> I, don't know. I don't know what the statement is or if it's good but it's strange oh yeah but yeah um, then they see Sol- he sees solitaire again yeah she's she's back in under kananga's control he's in mr big face right that's <laughs> when we get the reveal that kananga is mr big so even that's kind of strange it's like and i guess it kind of makes sense because kananga is supposed to be like a dictator he's the He's the dictator of San Monique. So I guess he couldn't be the head of a crime, you know, uh, he couldn't be the kingpin. So he uses this persona of Mr. Big, complete with, you know, a prosthetic mask to run the operations as Mr. Big. So Yeah. Uh, that was weird. <laughs> it, it's kind of weird, yeah. But, uh, yeah, from there... Uh, they sort of figure out that she's lost her power to Bond. Yeah, she's testing him and and pressing him for, you know, whether or not he slept with her, because he knows that once she's like be spoiled by a man's touch, that she's no longer. It's like you know, once once Bond's had her his way with her, she's no longer of any use to anybody. <laughs> and then she gets the smackdown thrown on her. Yeah. And after that, they take him to the farm. Yeah, that's when they go to the alligator farm. And that was kind of—I didn't mind that scene. No, no, no. I'm fine with the uh, the way it played out. Like the they they build the tension pretty well with uh, Tee Hee. Tee is <laughs> kind of threatening Bond with you know feeding the crocodiles and the alligators with the chicken and just kind of you know being pretty obvious about what's going to happen or what they expect to happen of, you know, he, he's being fed to the alligators. Yeah, I could have done without the tour of their facilities. Sure, yeah, the, the walking hell? into the cabin and finding the, the drug processing factory. 
It's like, here, Bond, this is where you'll uh, go and destroy later after you escape. Yeah, yeah. We always show our victims, you know, our full operation before we kill them. So weird. But then uh, I like the fact that the watch didn't completely work to get him out of the mess with the boat. Yeah, it was it was a nice touch that he expects the boat to, you know, get him out of this jam because he's he's been separated on this tiny little mud bank, and yeah, the but then, he magnetizes the boat, yeah. but it's tied up, so that's a nice little uh, nice setup and and let down. But then it completely undermines itself with the cartoon move of running <laughs> across lined up gators. Yeah, which. The impressive part about that is that was a real stunt with real alligators. Was it? It was. They wow. what they did was they tied the alligators down. So essentially all they could do is move their their head and tails and then they had the uh the stunt performer or it might have even been the owner of the alligator farm cuz the owner of the alligator farm is Ross Kananga, which is where they got the name for Kananga. Huh. And it might have even been him performing the the run across the alligators. It might have, but it might have just been a stunt person. Wow, I thought they were. I can't I, remember. I for sure thought they'd be fake. Yeah, and I kept waiting for the transition from real gator, real alligators to fake alligators. But I was shocked, you know, once the their heads all snapped up, and and then I did some did some digging, and it was a real stunt performed. Um, apparently on, on like the last take, one of the last alligator got a hold of, uh, the guy's like pant leg or boot, you know, <laughs> so it, so even though they were tied down, they were still pretty dangerous. Yeah, that'd be sick to get to run across them. Yeah. Yeah, I thought they were, I thought it was like a pup or something. I didn't think they were right. real. Yeah. So, <laughs> that's so stupid to make them real. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I think mean, that's probably why I didn't assume they were real because it'd be dumb to sure piss off that many gators in a row. Yeah, uh, but the scene was still kind of ridiculous. Um, yeah, I mean, it's it's like any other Bond uh, death trap. You know, if it's not alligators, it's sharks, and so we you know they put them in the. <laughs> yeah, well, we'll get more of that. Yeah, yeah. Unfortunately, um, they did not have laser beams. No, no. Freaking sharks. And laser beams. What about alligators with laser beams? Ooh, that'd be nice. Or alligators with uh, metal jaws. Ooh, that'd be tight. Yeah, that'd be that'd be pretty sweet. <laughs> um, and of course, like any other Bond death trap, like they assume that he's just going to be eaten by alligators. Oh yeah, they go on lunch break. And they go on lunch, yeah. But I I like that. You know, instead of, like, trying to run into the building and getting a gun and, like, killing everybody, Bond's plan is to just set the alligators loose on them while he sets the building on fire. <laughs> I liked it. It's a cool move yep. by Bond. It's it's a nice, like... That's what saved that scene for me. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Um, let's see. And then, of course, that's when the boat chase begins. Yeah. And then it just ended five minutes ago. Right. Cool. <laughs> I mean, right away, I was just like, as soon as I saw that hillbilly cop. Oh, man. And I. I was. J.W. Pepper. J.W. Pepper, he's a special character that. Um, I don't want to give anything away, but. <laughs> you haven't seen the last of J.W. Pepper. Oh. <laughs> oh. And I'll also spoil this he pops up in another franchise. Pops up in another franchise. Oh yeah! Please say it's Star Wars. No, no, it's uh, he's in in Superman two when uh, and basically playing the same exact character basically um, when Zod and Ursa and Nan show up on Earth, like he's the cop that, that they interact with. Of course he is. And I mean, I, I'm, I'm astonished at the level of uh, like to which people listen to this guy. He's a cartoon character. Yeah, well, it's like... I thought those two guys that showed up after the boat crashed into his car... Right. I thought they were just going to make fun of him. Well, and you think, because it's like... And I think that's because of a... He's a sheriff, and they're uh, like state troopers, so they've they've got that, you know... Uh, oh, that rivalry already. Well, yeah, but, I mean, he's just a so, sheriff of a parish. They're 
they yeah right so they shouldn't have to listen to yeah. him i would think i mean maybe because they're on his turf maybe he has he outranks them but it's he's just he's such a cartoon character every line he says is so over the top and he's like ah commandeer this here vehicle Oh, and yeah. that includes anyone inside said vehicle. Oh, yeah, he's just like, uh, what is it, Foghorn Leghorn? Yeah, pretty much. Uh, <laughs> I, I do said, like his oh, line. I said. Yeah, I like his line when uh, when he finally catches up to Bond. He's like, what are you, some kind of doomsday machine? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I mean, the guy has his moments, but it's just... He had too many moments. Too many moments. Yeah, that, you're exactly right. They, It seemed like you could have left some of him on the cutting room floor. You know, it's like, did the filmmakers just think, oh, this guy's golden. And I know. We just, have to, we just have to give the people what they want. And apparently what they thought people wanted was bumbling, you know, American cops. Well, yeah, that's what it felt like. I was like, are the English just making uh, the Americans? Because so far, I mean... Even the CIA is just there to clean up Bond's mess. Right. I mean, it seems like there's very little respect for the American law enforcement. Yeah. Because, I mean, the CIA agents either die or, like, uh, Are idiots. is the worst CIA agent ever. Right. There's not a very good American law enforcement or agent. No, I mean... Some of the some of the Felix Leiter moments we've had have been decent. Like the Felix from the first movie from Doctor No, he he was too cool, which is why they recast him. You know, because yeah. they thought they thought he was on par with how cool James Bond was. And ever since they've all the Felixes have been just slightly lesser versions than than the previous model. You know. Yeah, I mean, it's just I don't know. Like, Lighter just doesn't seem like he knows what's going on all the time. Yeah, or like I said before, he's just there to be Bond's babysitter. Like, he yeah. gets him out of the jam with these police who have been, who caught up with him from the boat chase. Yeah, he pays for the like plane. He pays for the planes, yeah. So, he's just kind of there. He's his liaison. He's his handler while he's on American soil, basically. Yeah. So. Wow. But, yeah, that boat scene, holy hell. Yeah, it just goes on so many places. And and then J.W. Pepper's brother gets called in because he's got a faster boat. And somehow <laughs> and Kanega's guy... And brother is Billy Bob. Yeah, Billy Bob. Of course. But somehow Kananga's brother... or <laughs> Kananga's one of his lackeys yeah. somehow yeah. finds Billy Bob and takes his boat instead. Yeah. You know, and so you get this supercharged boat that just continues the... The chase because it's now a faster, better boat. Yeah, but yet yeah, still has trouble catching up to Bond. Yeah, I mean, eventually they catch up, and it which like it, I like how Bond, Bond gets a get on the same side as Bond. What was that? It doesn't seem like he can like get up to where Bond is. He can get behind him. Yeah, but he doesn't ever seem to get neck and neck with him. Sure, but. Uh, uh, I did like when uh, the sheriff was going, here comes my brother. And everyone yeah. else sees that it's this big black dude. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. they're like, are you sure that's your brother? Yeah. Because <laughs> I don't know if he just wasn't looking. Yeah, it was weird that they, for some reason, they didn't have JW's reaction to who was really driving the boat. Yeah. But everyone else noticed. It up. Yeah. Yeah, but uh, I did like. Uh, I got confused as to how Bond splashed something in his face. Was it gas or something? It seemed like yeah, he took some gas, and I thought he was making a bomb, but okay. apparently he just poured some gas together or something and just splashed the guy in the face, which would would hurt. You know, you get gasoline in your eyes, and obviously it's gonna you're gonna take a minute. Uh, and then it turns into like a whirly bird chase where he just <laughs> spins and yeah, and then dramatically oh, explodes then... into the back of a tanker. Yeah, or some yeah. kind of thing. That explosion was way too big. Oh yeah. <laughs> but uh, halfway through the boat chase, I just wrote down in big letters: "Boat chases suck." 
Yeah. Yeah, they haven't managed to to get one just right yet. Well, I did like that one a uh, few movies back where um, there's like a bunch of boats chasing him. Yeah. And, uh, well, other than the fact that he can shoot out a gas tank at like nobody's business. Right. While himself on a boat, but I thought that that boat chase wasn't too bad. Yeah. I can't remember but which one that was. It was a uh, Connery one prob- before. Uh, probably the end of From Russia with Love. Might have been. Because the last boat chase I think we saw might have been the end of Thunderball, while, when they're on that big yacht that, like, separates into a... That's what I was thinking of. Super yacht. Yeah. <laughs> but then the, the the video playback is so... Or like, the projection, you know, out the front window is so bad, because it's like, you know, the rocks apparently, you know, are coming straight at them, but they're <laughs> yeah. just... The projection is so terrible, and... But the... But, explosions and I don't know I just found that more entertaining for some reason than this one sure yeah like this one was just like one boat it's just too much another boat was, <laughs> yeah yeah and, everybody has a boat everyone's chasing them yep and you jump over land every once in a while right yeah a lot of uh, driving boats on land because that's a thing that boats do mm-hmm um let's see uh, da, da, da. okay and I think I don't know, my notes probably didn't hold up during that chase scene. Right. Um, but I jumped to the island, and they're, um, I think this is the part where they're taking uh, Solitaire, and they're going to do some kind of ritual with her with the snake. Yeah, they're basically going to kill her the same way that uh, Baines was killed in the opening. So they've tied her up to like a ritual ritualistic kind of altar. Yeah, there's like some dudes that were humping the thing. Yeah, I, thought, I noticed that too. <laughs> I just wrote down pole humping, question mark. Yeah, yeah. And and throughout the movie, we've seen little little bits of this uh, Baron Samedi, who's like kind of looks like a witch doctor kind of kind of guy. I don't know if you watched wrestling in the nineties. Oh, I know exactly what you're Papa Shango. What you're, where you're going? Yeah, Papa Shango. That's who I thought of when I saw. Uh, same here. Who is a wrestler witch doctor, so... Yeah, I remember he creeped me out. He was almost as creepy as the uh, the pallbearer. Yeah, it was... The Undertaker. Papa Shango and The Undertaker had an epic battle. Yeah. Because Papa Shango could control the dead, and... Right. Uh, the Undertaker was kind of dead. <laughs> I, I miss 90s wrestling. Like, <laughs> yeah. It was so terrible, and... It was a soap opera for 10-year-old boys. But, and it was before you realized it was a soap opera, you know? Oh, yeah. I mean, it was real. You know? So all the stuff was, like, Undertaker, and, uh, I mean, I remember even going back further with, you know, Hacksaw Jim Duggan and Jake the Snake Roberts, and... Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's Sergeant Slaughter. Sergeant Slaughter, yeah. <laughs> the, what was that Sheik dude? He had the camel clutch. Um, yeah, the I, Iron Sheik. Yeah, Iron Sheik. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, we're going to have to do a wrestling podcast now from <laughs> late 80s, early 90s. Yeah. <laughs> and don't forget Rowdy Rowdy Piper. Oh, yeah. Right, See, yeah. I don't remember much of Rowdy Rowdy Piper. Oh, he was awesome. Yeah. He was, and he's... He was a bad, he was a bad guy, right? Yeah, well, he, he might have been both at one point, but he yeah. was the best when he was bad. Yeah. Because he was a good shit talker. Right. And, uh... Also part of one of the best movies ever made. Oh, uh, They Live? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now that's a fight sequence. Yeah. Oh. Came here to do two things. Chew bubble gum and... <laughs> and kick ass. Kick, kick some ass. And he was all out of bubble gum. Yeah, which apparently was like a... Uh, he improv that line, apparently. That's what I'm talking about. He was awesome at that. Yeah. Like, he could just, like... You know how, like, wrestlers do the whole, like, interview thing? Yeah. Like, with Mean Gene? I'm here to tell you! Yeah. He was the best yeah. at that. Uh, uh, him and Ric Flair were always fun to me. Yeah. Oh, Ric Flair. He always annoyed me. I couldn't stand Ric Flair. Oh. <laughs> oh. He had some good moments, though. Yeah. He was just so flamboyant. Right. Basically walked around like a peacock half the time. <laughs> all of them did. Oh yeah. I mean, all of 
all of wrestling is just like I need to put on a show and I need to you know appear larger than life and yeah well I mean he literally had feathers that were all kinds of colors on his jacket oh I don't I didn't remember like, that he had a it was like a feather boa but it was his entire like robe wow I guess that goes with the name Mr. Flair yep like, exactly Mr. yeah the uh, Nature Boy Ric Flair oh yeah. I never, put, I never got the connection of Nature Boy. Yeah, I, it must have been an earlier like development in his career or something. I don't yeah. quite understand it either. But anyway, back to Bond. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I like a, I like the little wrestling side uh, yep. side podcast we got going. <laughs> <laughs> I blame uh, Witch Doctor for that. Oh yeah, Papa Chango. Yep. <laughs> okay, now we're back. Now we're back. <laughs> I. Absolutely enjoyed him getting blown to bits and then popping back up. Oh, I know. It's I feel like, and that's okay. the, the strange thing about this movie is there's real supernatural elements here that they don't ever really come back to. I mean, no, you know, because Solitaire, I would say she genuinely can see the future. Yeah, she said it. At never the cards never lied to her before. Right. So we've got. Fortune telling, you know, and psychic abilities here shown with her, and then obviously like uh, I almost called him Papa Chango, uh, Baron Samedi, you know the. I mean, I guess you could play it off like it's a duplicate or it's a statue. Yeah, it seemed like a statue because it broke up like it was a. Yeah, but it was cool seeing him blow up. But uh, that sort of leads to the very end of the movie. Yeah. Yeah. Like, was that him for real? It was him, and I guess they wanted to bring him back for a future movie. Okay, so that's why you get the little little button of him at the end. Yeah, because the end he's just sitting on the front of a train, and I'm like, yeah, All right, is this just a weird way to close it? Like you opened it, or is he really? Yeah, there? it almost made me feel like the whole movie was like a ghost story, almost like, yeah, you know, he was like somehow telling this tale of of, but I don't know. Well, it's just weird because he dies in that coffin with the snakes. You think? I mean, I mean, I guess pretty lackluster battle. Yeah. Well, in I mean, the best battle in the movie we get is uh, Bond versus Teehee on the train, which is very similar to uh, the Russia with Love right. train battle. Sort of. Like the tight quarters and. Yeah, yeah, any, yeah, definitely. Um, that's just what I thought of as soon as I saw it. Oh, yeah. Anytime you see a train fight, you're automatically yeah. going to think of From Russia With Love. Um, and not to give anything away, but I saw uh, Spectre last night. Yeah. I finally went and saw it, and they they have a really good train fight. Ooh, you know what? That's what I was thinking of when I saw Papa Shango with Spectre. Really? Because Oh, uh, because of the, the death mask? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. I was like, oh, this makes me think of Spectre. Yeah, there's like the... And it's not giving anything away. I mean, they in the trailer they show you like they go to Mexico around the uh, Day of the Dead celebration. Yeah. So that's why everyone's wearing uh, skeleton masks and stuff. So uh, after Shango bites it in the snake pit of coffins. Yep. Uh, they go down the same way Papa Shango came up. Yeah, they use the, the headstone. Right. They use the little elevator yeah. system. And then. Uh, they run into the underground lair, finally. We see a good uh, evil lair. Yeah, which is like, why are we just now seeing the underground lair? Yeah. Oh, we we totally glossed over the poppy field. Oh, yeah. During, I guess, was that during Bond and Solitaire's escape from, from the island? Yeah. Okay. So it's, like, revealed that there's, yeah. like, this weird canopy just, like, what, five, six feet off the ground covering this poppy field so it looks like it's trees and brush for miles but it's really a poppy field covered with this you know canopy which is kind of a cool kind of a cool setup i guess yeah i mean a lot of people do that like even moonshiners have some kind of oh, okay thing so people can't see from the sky can't see it from the sky okay because uh yeah i mean that's used a lot in like uh you know you always like, hear about it in, uh, or see it in movies where somebody's growing, like, uh, marijuana, so they'll have, like, a tarp kind of cover, yeah, like, camouflaging it. Yeah. I've always heard of, like, because, you know, 
we're we're out here in Indiana, and I've always heard that you could you know pick a cornfield and you go like somewhere you know randomly through the middle of the cornfield and you'll find like a big patch of marijuana being grown in and amongst the the rows of of corn because it's kind of helps hide it and you know <laughs> whether I, I don't know how that. often what's that I did not know that. Oh really? I've I've always heard that that it's you know I don't know how true it is or how prevalent it is, but I've always heard that you know a lot of cornfields will be uh, substitute grow growing fields for mm. and and a lot of times I've heard that the farmers don't even know that like they don't they don't know what's going on in the middle of their field so yeah I mean in the Chicago area our thing was. Uh... It was all about like uh, nature preserves. Oh, okay. And people would grow out in the middle of nature preserves because nobody's around. Sure. And that's where you. So that like that's our urban legend of it. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay. So. Um. Oh yeah. Um. What's his face? Uh. I'm blanking on his name. Junior. Oh, Quarrel. Quarrel. Yep. Uh. He blows up the poppy seed field. Oh, that's right. Yeah, and, uh, I totally forgot about that. That's during the battle with Papa Shango, kind of. Yeah, it's it's so like they they kind of mention and they show that Quarrel has like a bunch of bombs or a bunch of timers that he's setting up, but they don't even like show the explosions. You, you just kind of see it like flash of light off off to the side. Yeah, and the, the weird thing is the bad dude didn't even care. Yeah. So I, yeah. I was like, okay. And that, and yeah. apparently the bad guy uh, has this, like, amazing underground layer out of... Yeah, with, seemingly complete nowhere. with monorail. It's just odd. Yeah. Like, this whole time he's had, like, uh, alligator farm layers, and... I mean, I thought the castle area was his main layer. Right. And Which... I would have been fine with that. I didn't need an underground, weird, yeah. like, monorail slash... <laughs> yeah, that. in what function does that really serve like yeah yeah this does this movie does go all over the place because we've already we didn't talk about it but when bond is taken underground let's see in new orleans and he meets back up with mr big when he reveals himself he he lays out his plan which is to flood the streets of i guess harlem and new orleans and anywhere where one of his Filet of Soul clubs happen to be, he's going to use those clubs as distribution points for free heroin. Yeah. So he's going to unload, what was it? I wrote it down. Was it 2,000 tons? <laughs> yeah. I think that's right, right? It was an 2000, obnoxious amount. Yeah, 2,000 maybe tons of heroin are going to be you know, unleashed on the streets for free, which is going to you know, Drive out get everyone hooked. Leader. Yeah, it's going to put everyone out of business. It's going to make him a monopoly, and you know, get millions of or hundreds of thousands of people hooked on heroin, so they'll be forced to come back to him. So that's the big threat of this movie is the American dr- war on drugs. Yeah. You know, that's it. There's no, I mean, and like obviously take over the world or. Uh, hypnotize people into killing leaders. Yeah, no uh, satellites in space with yeah. lasers or you know none of that. It's just a it's just a pretty simple, down and dirty you know drug drug crime operation. And uh, uh, we're getting to the part that just I did not understand whatsoever. Okay, was these magic pellets that made things blow up? Oh, you mean the shark gun? Oh, and maybe it's a real thing. I don't know. It's like an inflated the couch that Whisper was on. I know. And then <laughs> I know. <laughs> Do we have to talk about it yet? Oh, can we? Can we? Good <laughs> Lord. Um. <laughs> yeah, I mean, so I guess we could jump back a second. You know, so Bond is now in the underground lair, and he and Solitaire are just kind of poking around, trying to find. You know, I guess trying to get to Kananga, or no, when do they get captured? They get... Yeah, because they tie them up and they held the whole shark shark attack thing. Yeah. 
So at some point underground, they get captured. Yep, they tie them up to the pole that drops them very slowly yep. into shark-infested waters. Right, which I kind of was disappointed that they didn't also use alligators for this, you know, portion. Yeah, uh, it was weird. Yeah. Like, the whole layer... uh, (laughs) It's like they said, oh, he needs a cool, hip, concrete layer like every other Bond villain. Yeah, and so it's it's not... And that's one of the things I wrote down was, you know, Ken Adam was not on on this movie for for set design. So it just... It kind of was felt a little bit like a um what underground layers have we seen um dr no had an underground layer yep. um the volcano layer from uh you only live twice was kind of like this with the with the underground monorail yeah so it's like they kind of wanted it to have that feel but it's like you said why does this guy have an underground layer i know I mean, aside the whole island I mean, is his yeah and it, for me, it seems like the only reason they need to have anything underground is so that Papa Shango can rise up from the grave <laughs> and freak out the the locals. You know, yeah, that's that's it. <laughs> that's the only reason you need to be underground here. Yeah, it seems that way. I I assume okay, because because Whisper gets knocked into one of these hollowed out missiles. Yeah, it kind of looks like a missile. Yeah, I'm assuming that the poppies go from. They take them underground. They load them onto these missiles. And they load them onto the the whatever device that was that Bond and Solitaire are tied up to, and then they get put onto the monorail and then delivered somewhere. Like that's I'm assuming what function that serves. Yeah, but you could do that over land. It's not like anyone's yeah. gonna stop. Right. Yeah, you could easily load the poppy, you know, the heroin up onto trucks and drive them out. Yeah. So, don't know why it needs to travel underground, but I don't know. Maybe maybe the underground monorail goes to the alligator farm where they're actually processing it. Maybe. I mean, but well, the alligator I mean, farm isn't that in New Orleans? Oh shit, it is. Yeah. <laughs> so that can't. I don't know. It's a hell of an underground so, tunnel. Yeah. So <laughs> Kananga has a underground layer for his own personal reasons that we don't need to know about. <laughs> So we'll just move on to why he has... Uh, and then uh, he... Basically, they have Bond and Solitaire tied up. Yeah. He cuts on Bond's arm, but... Oh, yeah. I'm like, oh, why wouldn't you do a little more damage? Um. Well, I think it's just... Uh, I mean, you can still... He even more. says, like, you know, this this cut may not appear to be fatal, but it will, it will kill you, because essentially he's just... Wounding him in, in order to draw the sharks in. I know, but it's like you could hurt him a lot more than that. Right. I mean, but, he basically was cutting on him like he was a teenage girl with issues. Yeah. But, and also, Kananga is is more of the businessman. He's not the get his hands dirty and, like, actually kill someone type of, type of criminal. Yeah. Yeah, I guess that's what uh, Mr. Claw is for. Right. He has other people to do his dirty work. Man. And I guess it shows because he loses pretty quickly. Right. Once Bond uses his uh, blade watch. Yeah, once Bond breaks free, there's no fight, really. No. I mean, uh, Kananga kind of l- lunges at him with his knife a little bit, but... Yeah, Bond uses his magnetic watch to get the magical air pill. <laughs> Which, so he... We've already been shown that the the... The watch is magnet, magnetic, obviously, and yeah, it, it draws that pellet to him. Was there nothing else metal in the room that would have been, you know, why didn't the chair slide over to Bond, and why didn't, you know, if this was like uh, Austin Powers, there would have been like a, a crate full of paper clips next to it, right? And it would have just like attacked him. Yeah, everything else in the room would have been sucked. You know, over to him, but but no, just the pellet of airness. Yeah, the compressed air capsule or whatever. Yeah, uh, and then <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to talk about it. <laughs> Bond makes Kaninga eat it, and then uh, he, infl- he inflates. And it reminded me of the "I'm Fat" video by Weird Al. Yeah. And he just, like, inflates it like inflates. it's an obvious balloon. 
Oh, the goddamn Kananga balloon. And apparently the air leaks out his butthole or something because he flies into the ceiling. It, it Well, I think he inflates and then it, uh, for some reason it's like he's lighter than air because maybe it's a helium capsule. See, I assumed it just came out of his butthole. Oh, the I didn't even and think it about shot him that. Into the ceiling. Oh, God. <laughs> Which makes it even better. Yeah, kind of does. Oh, man. So, yeah, if you haven't watched this movie, <laughs> the end of the movie, Bond throws this capsule into Kananga's mouth. And why it makes him... Because Bond also was hiding the capsule in Bond's mouth. It didn't blow up Bond. So I don't know why when Bond shoves it into Kananga's mouth, it makes him... You know, why does it go off then? Maybe he triggered it when he stuffed it in. I guess so. Um, and yeah, so the the villain of the movie gets blown up slowly. I mean, you know, uh, instead of just blowing up, he literally inflates. Yeah. And it's rises to the <laughs> top of the cave, yeah. and then and then once he hits the the top of the cave, then literally explodes. He's Oh god, it's so bad. And it's it's even if it had been a good effect, it's still a terrible Oh yeah. The concept you know, even is ridiculous. If the concept is so bad. It was worse than when Goldfinger got sucked out of the plane. Oh, totally. Cuz that you kind of can buy that it might happen. Yeah, that was just poorly executed. Right, that was a yeah uh, example of poor execution. This is an example of poor execution and poor poor concept. writing, poor planning, <laughs> yeah. poor you know if they literally couldn't think of another way to dispatch Kananga, you know, throw him into the the shark tank, you know, throw him. I don't know. I, don't know, I thought they were going to do or, something where he gets like a crap ton of heroin stuffed into him or something. Sure, yeah. I don't know. It's it's pr- pretty, you know, terrible way to end a movie. Yeah. And then I don't I don't understand Bond and Solitaire cuz she like betrayed him but then he saves her. Yeah, cuz they're I don't He saves her at the very end. Yeah. Cuz they um, end up on a train together at the end. Right. Yeah, what's their where, where are they going from? I don't know, but it's like a 16-hour train ride. Yeah. Yeah, I forget what the motivation to get them on a train is. From New Orleans to New York, maybe? It must be. Why they can't fly, who knows. But they get on a train, yeah. And, then and uh, I kind of like that, that the henchman, you know, Teehee, comes back, you know, to, to fight Bond. You know, I'm all, I'm, usually I'm in favor of the uh, kind of the end of the movie being the henchman returns to finish Bond off. Yeah, I mean, they've done it before. Right, with uh, Irma Bunt, or no, uh, Rosa Klebb, at, after, what was it? Oh, you mean... From Russia With Love. Yeah. She she came back for him. I was thinking of uh, the uh, one that, um, well, she comes back with um, the mastermind, but uh, Frau... Yeah, yeah. Uh, oh, uh, uh, Irma Bunt with, with Blofeld. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. When uh, they kill his wife. Right. So she started. Oh, and uh, uh, Diamonds Are Forever. We had uh, Mr. Wint and Mr. Kidd. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. So I guess it happens a lot more than than I realize. But and I'm I'm usually I usually dig the uh, the return of the henchman. Yeah, he sort of just barges in. I thought he was going to kill um, Solitaire first. Right. But yeah, he just it wouldn't locked her up in the bed. <laughs> I know. And she has no concept of what well, once she, you know, is released from the bed, she acts like she didn't just hear a fight going on, you know. Well, she's a woman. And, oh yeah, <laughs> she's a woman who can't see the future anymore. So she's <laughs> she has no like, I don't know. Yeah, and then the fight sequence is basically him, uh, or uh, Teehee throwing his arm into things and. Yeah, a lot of smashy, 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 and you know, breaking glass and breaking walls, yeah. and just enough to for Bond to rip off his uh, his like jacket enough to reveal the the inner workings of his of his arm. Which I thought was kind of cool that it was his entire arm. Yeah, 
not just his hand was robotic. Um, yeah, because he said the gator got his whole arm. Right. Because up to then, you just assume it's it's just his, his hand. Well, yeah, that and the fact that it's, you know, hanging down lower than it should. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, but I, I liked how uh, Bond was able to cut the uh, hydraulics, I guess. Yeah, right, yeah. No, not so, hydraulics, it was a uh, string. Yeah, just the connecting wire yeah. from from whatever mechanism to the claw. So it locks the claw into a position where he can't <laughs> where he can't remove it. Oh man. And then uh Bond nonchalantly tosses him out the window. Yeah. And his arm is left dangling there. <laughs> yeah, that's kinda kind of a cool it kind cool of made me it, the the uh, framework of the arm itself made me think of like Terminator. Oh yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, Skynet was born that day. <laughs> and then uh, he pulls her out of the bed or undoes the bed from the wall. Yeah. And throws the arm out the window and goes back to being Bond. Right. And then you get the weird uh, shot on the front of the train with the shaman. Yeah, back from the Baron, dead, apparently. Baron Samedi, who's just yeah, just he's just hitching a ride on the train. This is weird. Yeah, it is a weird, you know. This whole movie was just like I don't know what's real, what's not, <laughs> or what the hell just happened. Did that guy really yeah. blow up? Right. It was a bizarre ending to a bizarre overall movie. It is a weird movie for sure. And then it cuts back into you know the theme song of. Uh, Paul McCartney. Yeah. <laughs> Apparently when, uh, so this is 73, so the Beatles had already, mm-hmm. obviously, you know, they've, we've already had the rise and fall of the Beatles, you know, because by 70 they were broken up. But still, like Paul McCartney, like his, he's still legendary, right? Oh, yeah. So they yeah, hire him Eagles to write. The, era, or not Eagles. Um, the wing, wing Wings, era. yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> so they've, they've hired him to, you know, come up with this this song, and I guess the uh, I forget if it was, I think it's Harry Saltzman who was one of the producers. After he hears the Paul McCartney version of the song, says, "Okay, now who's going to sing it?" Because yeah. <laughs> <laughs> apparently they wanted someone like uh, oh, what's her name, Diana Ross. Really? Someone like that, like a they wanted to get that like um, keep the female you know, power. Voice. A powerful black female voice, you know, wanted someone like that to sing the song instead of... Well, they sort of did that in a nightclub. Right, and I'm guessing that was kind of what they were going for there. Um, So, just a... It's just so, like, you you just never think someone's going to say, okay, we've got Paul McCartney, okay, but who's going to sing the song, you know? Yeah. So... So, yeah, we're done. Yeah, I mean, that's... That's it. That's the end of that one. That's it, thank you. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, this was one of those that when I, you know, turned it on, I th- I my memory of it was was a lot better than kind of what I was what I was watching what I was the first, you know, half hour, 45 minutes of the movie are are really pretty good cuz it's it's the it's the weird opening, you know, but then you get Bond going to New York and then uh, you know, I like all the New York stuff with with Bond. Um, but then once they get to, I don't know when the movie kind of slows down, probably when they start to investigate the island, Yeah. Bef- right before, maybe right after Rosie Carver comes in, that's probably when the movie just really just falls apart Yeah. for me. And then the boat scene just added insult to injury to me. Yeah, yeah. I was like, holy hell, we could have ended this like 20 minutes ago. Yeah. Uh, well, I think we all know what the con is. <laughs> for yeah, like yeah, and and it's it's bad. But I wrote down a list of what made this a weird movie for me, oh, okay. and kind of, and kind of what made it not feel like a Bond movie sure. more so than a than a list of cons. Okay. Um, so I've got there's no Roger or Roger Moore doesn't get any kind of like great you know spectacular Bond introduction. Um, you know, M shows up at Bond's house. There's no Q. We have one gadget, which is the watch. Yeah. Um, the black exploitation kind of theme of the movie is really heavy and strange. Um, 
the the overall threat of being you know just a drug. Yeah. You know, the the heroine is is the big threat. Um, the boat chase, J W Pepper, <laughs> just all of that, and then the the end fight with the Kananga balloon just really. Oh. It's just a weird movie, so I don't want to necessarily list those all as cons, but... That'll pretty much cover any con for this movie. Yeah. Like, the action just wasn't there for me. Well, and there's nothing... Like, Bond... I felt like I was watching it, and I was trying to think of, okay, what does Bond really do? Like, he doesn't do any really great detective work, because really all he, ha- all he does is infiltrate the island... Well, before that, he bumbles into the uh, the Filet of Soul Club, yep. and then the tarot uh, shop, where he buys the snake and then sneaks into the back of that and spies on, you know, whatever, Kananga. Um, but aside from, like, he doesn't really do much. He shows up to the island, he hooks up with Solitaire... Like, even when he's with Rosie Carver, like, he doesn't accomplish anything other than finding out that she's a double agent. Yeah. Um, there's just a lot of Bond not doing anything, you know? Because the boat chase doesn't get him closer to anything. The, <laughs> no. And, like, we don't see Kananga do anything. We see him take meetings. He doesn't... He gets captured a lot. Bond does, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but even Kananga, we don't see him, aside from take some meetings, he's not... And that that could be the problem with not having a you know a nuclear weapon or a laser satellite satellite like there's nothing for Kananga to do either other than play you know other than take solitaire you know yeah, he's around sort of handling like, the mystical supernatural yeah. force yeah which is another but there's just odd nothing bond, non bond thing yeah so it's just a weird movie where nothing really happens other than a lot of time is wasted from getting from point A to point B, kind yeah, of. Even when Coral but, Jr. blows up the field, it doesn't really mean anything. Right. <laughs> so we don't even, for one, we don't see it happen. Yeah. You know, other than the the planting of the bombs and then a light show where we're supposed to, you know, assume that that's the explosion going off. But yeah, there's no real resolution from that. Other, I mean, I guess if Kananga's whole business is shut down, that's a good thing, but. I mean, other, yeah, that's the only thing that he's done is he blew up the leader. Yeah. And apparently nobody can pick up where he left off. Right. It's apparently not like Hydra. Well, and the bad thing is, I think I think what this movie could have used is a scene where the citizens of San Monique were happy that Kananga was gone. Because everything we're shown of every community, whether it's Harlem New Orleans or San Monique, everyone goes along with Kananga. Yeah. Had we seen a scene of him, like the end of uh, Star Wars, when the Emperor is killed, like everyone's, you know, happy and and having, you know, celebration that, you know, this dictator, this evil guy is dead. So it leads me to think, like, someone's just going to take up Kananga's, you know, Someone's going to fill in for for that vacuum and just, like, I don't know. It just, the people, like I said, the people in Harlem and New Orleans, it's like, it's not like they're going to go off and lead better lives because it seems like they were, you know, in on it with the bad guy. So well, I'm sure his drug money was bringing in a lot of uh, money to the island. Yeah. So, I don't know. It thinks this, the res, there's no resolution here other than... I mean, Bond we, stops the bad guy. Bond yeah. stops the bad guy from Assuming distributing more drugs. What's that? And we assume by stopping today you know, that that stops this whole plan. Yeah, I mean, it stops the plan of distributing these drugs. Yeah. You know, I don't know. It's just a strange resolution. Like I said, I, had I been shown that the communities that were in Kananga's pocket, like, had then. Be- Come better off by him not being there. I would have been satisfied. Yeah, I don't know. Awesome and this, it, what's that? Apparently, he was just an awesome dude. I guess so. You know, and this, you know, this is just now kind of occurring to me. I just wasn't hasn't been like bugging me the entire time. It was just something that occurred to me that like, everyone seems to go along with him, and I don't know. He's a hell of a guy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs>
Um, I mean, so I guess we've kind of already gone through some cons, unless there's something else you want to specifically add. Uh, no, I mean... That's pretty much I'm, I don't want to beat a dead horse. The, the pros are... Uh, I don't even know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I had two pros. Yeah, I mean, the pro is at least the watch is kind of cool. Yeah, the watch is cool. I use it a lot, but at least it's, yeah. You know, um, one of mine was the, I like the theme song, you know, <laughs> yeah. I really dig the song. It's got a weird middle to it, but it's kind of appropriate for the movie. Yeah. And from what I've, what I've learned about that, you know, about that song, like the middle part where the song gets really weird, that's, that was Linda McCartney's contribution to the song. So yeah, nice. Yeah. Um, I don't know if that's true or not, but that's what I've heard. Um, you got any more pros? Um, <laughs> I like the guy's sideburns that drove the tech. <laughs> he was awesome. <laughs> yeah, the cabbie was awesome. Um, okay. I like Roger Moore. I think he's he's very smooth and he's very confident, and um, it's a natural performance. It's different than what we've had as Bond, but I do like it. I, I like Roger Moore. So. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I just wasn't that into this one. Yeah, no, that's that's totally understandable. And and oh, after like, yeah, oh, and I can the weird thing is notes, I got lost. Oh yeah, you jump around so much. Yeah, I couldn't remember how we got to you know from one scene to the next. Like like I like we talked about earlier. Like what happens after the airplane chase? We couldn't remember how Bond escapes, but that's I'd know weird. that he comes back with Felix, you know. I'm assuming he abandons that plane with no wings and then gets into a car. Right, but... But I just don't remember it. I don't either. So, there's just things like that that are so... Like, scenes take so long. Yeah. But then they have follow-ups that are so non-memorable, you know. But... Yeah. Um... So what are you going to rate this bad boy? Um, I'm going to give it a two and a half. Okay. I, I was thinking a two. Okay. Just because it, I never want to see this movie again. Okay. I felt like I needed to... Uh, I lost part of my life. <laughs> <laughs> it was just a pointless movie. I, just, I had no... In- like I was really, and I think it's probably because I'm bitter because I thought I was gonna like it at the beginning. See, and I did too. I went into this one thinking, "Oh, I, I think this is a good one," um, but yeah, it's, it's just confusing. I, I think once they, oh. like I said, I think once they introduce Rosie Carver, like even then, it's like, okay, where's this gonna go? But no once they start going to the island, I think that's when it just really slows down and just. So, so do yourself a favor if you haven't watched it, don't watch it. Yeah, I think you could skip this one. See uh, all the Bond movies, and you have to do it. Yeah, um, I mean this one we're gonna give this one a two point two five. Uh, gotta be um, one so of just, our lower Bonds. It's definitely. I mean, it's probably even lower than Thunderball because I think Thunderball is the one that we went into. I you know was was dreading it. I think this movie uh-huh. just made me mad. <laughs> it's like, why? I don't like this. What's going yeah. on? Why are we in hillbilly land with this guy? Yeah. I think that's what put me over the edge. Sure. That boat chase just irritated me to no end. I was like, I want to fast forward through this so bad. I know. Uh, but I stuck through it. Like a good soldier. Uh, it, it, I'm, I'm telling you, if you want to torture somebody, just play that scene. Over and over. <laughs> oh, that was brutal. So yeah, thanks yeah, a lot, so, Travis. Yeah, hey, <laughs> it's, it's why I'm here. No warning. Come on. <laughs> um, let's see. It looks like we gave uh, Doctor No was a two point seven five. Okay. Um, I think. Uh, let's see. I think yeah, Thunderball. We gave like a three point two five. Wow. I think uh, I've so, noticed that if. Or I think the movies that we watched before are going to somewhat influence how we feel about the next movie. That could be. Because the last movie with the apes wasn't my yeah. favorite either. 
Right. And I don't know if I just got into a funk or something with it. I mean, Could don't be. get me wrong, this movie's bad. Yeah. But I'm guessing that's maybe why I'm rating it as low as I am. Could be. Because I've seen two stinkers in a row. Right. Yeah, that could be. Um, and I know I said this on the last one, but I think the next one's gonna be really <laughs> gonna be better. Okay, um, I believe you. <laughs> I'm just trying to see how many times I can get away with crying wolf before you'll you'll just say screw this podcast, I quit. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, no, but I I genuinely remember enjoying Man with the Golden Gun. And I've seen that one a few times, so my memory of it's better than than my memory of Live and Let Die. Well, they do uh, like gold in the Bond universe because you got right Goldfinger, Golden Gun, Golden Eye. And you know that's not a bad point because those are gener- generally regarded as being yeah. some of the better movies. Because Golden Eye is is you know I think considered the best of the Brosnan yeah. movies. Goldfinger was a great Bond movie. Oh, yeah. So maybe that is there's something to that that the gold movies are the gold standard, <laughs> the gold standard of Bond. We'll see, I guess. Yeah. Stay tuned. <laughs> um, Did you hear gosh, the we... Bond theme? I only heard it once, I think. Oh, I noted that too. Yeah, there was very little of the Bond music that we're used to. Because um, I feel like they, they used the theme music more. Yes, they used the theme, and and part of that is. You know, so they bring in Paul McCartney to write the song. Well, they also brought in George Martin to do the the music for the rest of the movie. Mm-hmm. He did the score. George Martin was like the Beatles producer, uh. you know, almost not not exclusively. Like they dipped in and out of other producers, but George Martin was he was one of the fifth Beatles. You know, uh, okay, um, one of the many fifth Beatles, yeah. like you know Pete Best and all the other. Um, but yeah, so George Martin was, you know, I guess just wanted to use the the live and let die theme a lot more. And, and and as soon as you said that, I remembered writing down that the very little Bond music is played throughout this movie. And that's one of the things that makes it, you could easily forget, or if you've never seen this before, if you sat down in the middle of the movie, you wouldn't know it's a Bond movie. Yeah, I mean, they barely ever say his name in the movie either. Right, yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, he's called Honky a couple times. <laughs> right. <laughs> but, yep, yeah, so I am going to believe you and assume that the Golden Gun is not a golden turd. <laughs> um, I mean... If you yeah, wrong me... I, I, I will say this. I enjoy Man with the Golden Gun. <laughs> okay. So take that as you will. Like I don't, you know, it may not be a great movie. Um, it's got to be better than this one. It's definitely better than this, this one. one. And I, I mean, I remember not loving this one, but or, uh, Live and Let Die. But I, I guess I thought it was just a better Roger Moore introduction than it turned out to be, because it really isn't. You know, it's just not a. It's kind of a dud as far as. Introducing your next, you know, actor for Bond. Yeah. Right. And maybe they weren't trying to do that. Maybe they weren't trying to introduce the new actor, because that makes it all about the actor. Yeah, you know? they didn't break the third wall like they did with right. and And maybe that's, you know, because the numbers don't lie. Maybe they thought, well, let's not try and make it a big movie. Let's try and just make it a, a okay movie, you know. I think that uh, is one of the Bond movies I remember the best. I and that's my favorite Bond movie yeah. is on well, especially of the older ones. I think um, we'll get to my favorite Bond movie later, but but yeah, Honor Majesty's Secret Service is and is kind of regarded as being one of the better Bond movies. Yeah. So I don't know, but yeah, it's just a weird. This one's just a weird movie. So wah, wah, wah. Uh, yeah, but I, I think it's. Um, I think it's well regarded. I mean, I think a lot of people like this movie. Ugh, well, but horrible then. Um, I'd be really interested to find out from from our listeners what other people thought of this movie. Is it just us, like not having a good time with this one? Um, so you know, if listeners, if if you really like this one, let us know why. I'd love to know why <laughs> this one is a is a favorite or yeah. 
you know. So. And then tell us what other movies you like, because I'd like to know if maybe <laughs> you just got bad taste. Right, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, if your favorite movie, if your top five favorite movies are Live and Let Die and The Ladies' Man and Air Bud, then just don't listen to this podcast. And Air Bud is a franchise. <laughs> Believe me, I know, unfortunately. Yeah. Oh. I like that you pulled Ladies' Man. Well, I was going, I was almost said it's Pat, because okay. I wanted one of those like obscure SNL oh, yeah. uh, movies. You could go with a lot of yeah. like Night at the Roxbury. Well, Although that might yeah. be like a cult favorite. Kind of. That one has at least some redeeming yeah. elements to it. They took a really funny sketch and just stretched it out into a you know a useless movie. Like the Coneheads was pretty bad. Yes, yeah. I mean, the only one that I could think of that did very well was Wayne's World. Oh, yeah. That's probably the... Was Blues Brothers an original... SNL sketch? I don't know if it was a sketch or if it was just a musical act. Okay. I wasn't sure if it was just something like, if it was the same thing where they took a sketch and built a movie around it or if I it was a... they were just a musical act. Okay. Like, and it was like the early SNL days, so they were a little loose. They could get away with doing that kind of yeah, thing? Yeah, I don't really remember them being in a skit huh. with the Blues Brothers. Yeah. I remember them performing on SNL, but... You know, at yeah. the blues brothers, like singing and dancing. Right. It wasn't like Jake and Ella, like, you know, having a conversation or anything. Right, yeah. Party on Early. Jake, yeah. party on <laughs> Elwood. Yeah, it wasn't too wild and crazy, guys. Right. Although, I'm surprised that didn't become a movie. Yeah, oh, man. That was horrible. It's, it's not too late. <laughs> I know. <laughs> They're still around. Because those guys were playing old men, so they're now old men, so they could actually... Yeah, well, they're back. I mean, they came back for that skit on the anniversary. A few times, yeah. Uh, oof, yeah. So, yeah. Um, I'd say the highlights, um, probably our discussion on wrestling from the mid-90s to early, early 80s. Yeah, yeah. I'm definitely not cutting that out. That was the best part of the movie. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> was Papa Shango? Yeah, because that's when I started daydreaming about wrestling. Yeah, well, I forgot how they escaped and got on planes and stuff. Yeah. Oh man, but yeah, I'll look forward to the man with the golden gun, and then after that, it's Star Wars. So at least I get a reprieve there. Yeah. Unless it sucks too now. <laughs> After all these years, you just realize it's a terrible movie. Yeah, I, I find out that they spend an hour talking about hydration. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> talking about how to evaporate water from the desert. Yeah. Oh. Or evaporate or whatever. Yeah, I don't know. I just remember they were doing some kind of farm work with water. and. Yeah. I, I don't know. <laughs> but that, that scene where Luke goes into Tashi Station to pick up power converters is an amazing scene. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> the fact that you knew how, like all of those words to put in that sequence <laughs> scared me. I might have seen Star Wars once or twice. I have seen A New Hope three times. Wow! Uh, in my life. <laughs> wow! And every every episode, it's just like I'm peeling back layers of because first you're like, oh, the best movie in the world is Spaceballs, and then your last time you're talking about. You haven't seen Star Wars in like ten years. Yep. So I'm just and I'm just learning so much. I think I've seen Spaceballs about a hundred and three times. Oh my god, you <laughs> son of a bitch! <laughs> <laughs> oh. And I'm not even lying. <laughs> I couldn't even make it through Spaceballs once. It, it's something I always just kept out in the background, but it sucks you in. <laughs> It's like it's like right up there with Citizen Kane. Oh god. <laughs> I'm pretty sure it's a Turner classic. I want that on your tombstone. <laughs> Spaceballs. It's right up there with Citizen Kane. Yep. Oh man. Hey, you know what? Don't judge. Yeah. I found Spaceballs to be a visionary take on the space saga. Oh boy. <laughs> 
<laughs> we're gonna ha- or we might have to do that that Star Wars episode via Skype so that I don't rain blows down upon you. Oh jeez, you are gonna be nerding out like there's no tomorrow. Yeah, and I'll be like, okay, yeah, that beep bop booping robot, and you're gonna be like trying to throttle me because it's R two D two. And then I'll be uh, like, uh, yeah, the chick with the buns on her head. I'm going to totally forget, like, all of the normal stuff for this movie. Yeah. That everyone knows. <laughs> I've forgotten more about Star oh, Wars. <laughs> easily. <laughs> I'm going to assume that everyone in that uh, bar is Boba Fett. <laughs> They're all just Boba Fetts, right? Yeah, yeah that means uh, mercenary, right? Boba Bounty Fett hunter. shot first. <laughs> <laughs> That's going to be my t-shirt. Uh, <laughs> uh, you're welcome, everyone. I suddenly want something really bad to happen to you right now. Hey. <laughs> you know what? We just watched this movie, so... Oh, okay. It's already so, done enough harm yeah. for me. That's a fair point. Uh, no, I know a little bit more about Star Wars than I'm letting on. Yeah. I'm just hamming it. But, yeah, <sighs> true, I've probably... We got, we got a shuck and jive for uh, these people. We're like the wrestlers of our time. That's true. I'm the heel. Yeah. Like Star Wars. Lame <laughs> Wars. I'm not a very good heel. Yeah. <laughs> like Star oh, Wars. That's the one with uh, Indiana Jones, right? Yeah. Okay. And that kid from uh, Corvette Summer. <laughs> yeah. And the uh, mom from the Burbs? Yeah, that's her. Okay. <laughs> cool. <laughs> That's be awesome. I can't wait until they blow up that old dude's house with the skeleton. Yeah. On uh, Tatooine. Right. And I'm pretty sure there's like a crystal skull they find somewhere with <laughs> Han Solo's stuck in a fridge and escapes a nuclear blast. Oh, you're talking about the the best Indiana Jones movie? Oh yeah, by far. <laughs> I mean, you got uh, hey. 80 year old Jones surviving a nuke blast in the fridge. You got. Uh, uh, Shia LaBeouf uh, swinging with monkeys. Hey, I, I'll be the first to say that I will watch Crystal Skull over Temple of Doom. Wow. Yeah. That, that I'm noise, not saying that it's my silence was everyone just <laughs> thinking of how they want to murder you right now. Yeah, yeah. Come on. I mean, what? Yeah, I, I don't like Temple of Doom. The dude rips out hearts. Okay, There's yeah, it's, it's got good moments, for sure. There's an epic cart chase. See, the cart chase is what... So, a lot of people give Kingdom of the Crystal Skull, like, a lot of grief about, you know, Shia LaBeouf being Tarzan or whatever, stuff like that, the ridiculous mm-hmm. moments of King Crystal Skull, the fridge, the fridge thing, but... To me, the cart chase in Temple of Doom is just as outlandish and ridiculous as anything that happens in Crystal Skull. Oh. <laughs> How dare you take a gigantic dump on my childhood. You are just- now, that's not to say that you know it doesn't have good moments, because the fight on the bridge between Indy and uh, the dudes chasing him, like, that's an awesome... And I swear, you crap... On the inflatable raft that rests in <laughs> on their fall. <laughs> that is so real, not even funny. <laughs> uh, God. So now you know what it's like to. Uh, every time you mention space balls, it's like some some little part of me dies. So so now you know what it's like. He gets teleported, and his ass is backwards. <laughs> what? <laughs> his head's on backwards, so he's looking at his own butt. And he says, how come nobody told me my butt was this big? Comic genius. Ugh. Is that, is that that's something that happens in Spaceballs? It is. Okay. <laughs> and it, and <laughs> the person that beams him down is snotty. Ugh. Not Scott. Oh, oh, so they're taking shots at Star Trek, too. Yes, which makes oh, it okay. worse for you. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> Spaceballs <sighs> is so awful. I love it. Yeah, well, okay. I guess we all have to have those those hang-ups in life. That... All right, everyone tell uh, Travis how much you love Crystal Skull as well. <laughs> There's going to be a lot of silence. Yep. No, I, I 
completely understand that it's not a well regarded movie, but I enjoyed it. So uh, I had fun during it. It's not, you know, it's still not, it's nowhere near the uh, Raiders of the Lost Ark or Last Crusade for me, but. All right. Well, I am completely bummed out now. Okay. Well, you know, I wanted uh, to make sure you like, I didn't want you to go from having to watch this movie to having to talk about that movie to, you know, suddenly being in a good mood. You know, I couldn't have that, so I had to bring you back down to... <laughs> okay, now i got to go watch Temple of Doom. <laughs> and that, if you ruined it for me, I swear. <laughs> uh, now I'm going to have to find something that you love and destroy it. Yep, good luck. <laughs> I, I love everything. <laughs> okay. You didn't love this movie. No, I didn't love this one. But. <sighs> All right, well... We should wrap it up before you make me cry more. All right. So next episode, uh, Man with the Golden Gun. Um, between now and then, you know, let us know if you like Live and Let Die. Um, let us know why. You know, give us some. We'd love to get some feedback on this one. Yeah. So just email us at uh, realcomicheroes at gmail dot com, and we'll uh, we'll share your uh, input on the next episode. Yeah, if you loved this movie, you probably like Crystal Skull. Let's just put it that way. <sighs> Bad taste. What? We don't we don't all like the same movies, Patrick. Me and my Crystal Skull fan club are <laughs> offended offended that you would insinuate. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you and your Crystal Skull fan club. <laughs> <laughs> so you and five dudes that just hang around, lamenting that Shia LaBeouf didn't reboot Indiana Jones. Right. Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah. That's sad. We'll get there. Okay. <laughs> oh, we'll get there. All right. Oh. <laughs> You'll see. Okay. You'll all see. I didn't realize you were such a Shia LaBeouf fan. Hey, he's the best part of the Transformers movie, too. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we better stop while I can still uh, keep my food down. Okay. Oh, jeez. All right, well, we'll see you guys uh, with the golden gun, dude. That's right. Let's hope for a better time. <laughs> I think we'll have a better time. Okay. All right. All right, next time, guys. Bye. Later. man with a golden gun. He always uses a golden bullet. This trinket is sent with a note requesting special delivery to you. I have never seen Mr. Scudamanga. Mr. Bond, this is impossible. I can't... I can't tell you. You'll kill me. Who? Scudamanga. Roger Moore, back in action in the exotic east as James Bond. 007 on a collision course with the most dangerous man alive. The man with the golden gun. Hold on, sir. James Bond, on the job. The girls are willing. I've dreamed about you setting me free. The pace is killing. <laughs> old friends and new enemies. It's non-stop bomb. The action is spectacular. You're not. I sure am, boy. Reaching a new high for 007. Oh, 
Bonjour, Monsieur Bond. I am Nick Nut. Monsieur Scaramanga will welcome you personally. The target is the highest priced killer in the world. He plays a deadly game, and the stakes are sky high. cry okay good that shocked me <laughs> that, you, you were just saying that right nope oh okay. hey like i said it's not my favorite indiana Sometime jones movie, we're gonna but... have to watch those two back to back yeah and you will see the error of your ways uh i don't know you crap on the cart scene <laughs> <laughs> it's not a bad scene but it's no less ridiculous than Dude, anything are that you happens kidding me <laughs> he was swinging like he was a monkey. Yeah. These guys were just on carts. There's nothing that, that jumped about that. That jumped rails and landed exactly on the next rail. Like um, Evil Knievel did that all the time. Uh-huh. <laughs> wow. We'll, uh, we'll see. I think you're just we'll see who's right. I like spaceballs. Do you just want to hurt me? Yeah, that could be it, too. You're just vengeful. Yeah. The darkness is strong with this one. 